journalists. We are especially interested by all this matter. We have also pleasure to uh, to get uh, to have here Mr. Apuzzo, who is a colleague from the press, uh, which is uh, which is great. Um, so before to give the floor to the moderator to John uh, Edwards, I would like to ask our uh, distinguished speakers to sign our golden book. First, <coughs> just uh, put your signature here. And I would like to, to offer you uh, just uh, yes, a book about uh, cartoons. Uh, yeah. And then, then uh, Shapat, our vice president, is uh, signing cartoons in New York Times. Yeah. And Plantu from Le Monde is the president. Yeah. Everybody get one? No? OK. Good. So now, please, Mr. Edwards, I, I let you uh, take the floor. Actually, and uh, uh, you just push the button to speak, yeah. Thank you, no, no. <laughs> no Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm you sorry. Get to one oh, too. Well, this, yeah. is, this is worth coming up here for, yeah. so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Stephen Coe. I am the partner in charge of the Geneva office of Aiken Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld. Uh, for those who are not familiar with us, Aiken is a full service international law firm based in uh, the United States with offices in Asia, in Europe, uh, in Russia, uh, and uh, in the Middle East. And obviously, here in Geneva, we've been here for about eight years. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to be uh, hosting this program. And we're very excited to bring together a very diverse group of people from across uh, the city and the continent, uh, including from business and legal communities for all of you, uh, members of the core, the press corps, uh, representatives from various uh, trade missions, international organizations, higher educations, and others. So this is a very fascinating topic uh, that really speaks, I think, in different ways to different people in the room. Uh, and we are very grateful for the Press Club also for hosting this event and joining us in this discussion and the panelists for joining us as well. Um, my partner, Mark McDougall, uh, from our Washington, D.C. office uh, will kick us off very quickly here. Um, he is known as the cleaner, if you've seen press about Mark. Mark leads our reputational recovery practice, which means that he advises individuals and corporate clients in high profile and very sensitive situations uh, involving false information uh, disseminated through the media. Mark. Thanks. Is that better? Okay, thank you. My far left, uh, my friend Matt Apuzzo. Uh, Matt is a, a very distinguished uh, journalist uh, currently with the New York Times based in Brussels. He has won the Pulitzer Prize not once but twice most recently in 2018 uh, for his coverage along with his partner Adam Goldman uh, of the 2016 presidential election and the uh, involvement of uh, Russian uh, interests in that election. Um, he uh, is well known in, in Washington and New York and is becoming increasingly well known here in, Washington, in, in uh, Europe where he continues to specialize in law enforcement and security matters for the Times. Uh, next to Matt is uh, John Edwards. He'll serve as our moderator today. Uh, John is a, an editor in, uh, on Bloomberg's uh, Europe Consumer and Health Desk. Uh, he's stationed currently here in Geneva and has spent 16 years before that with the Wall Street Journal as deputy business editor. Uh, to my immediate left is my law partner, Stacy Mitchell. Stacy is a longtime uh, prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, and, and after that, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Stacy. Uh, spends a good bit of her time dealing with crisis management and reputational issues in our Washington office. And to my right is Zoe Newman. Uh, Zoe is a managing director of Kroll's Business Intelligence Unit in London. If you don't know Kroll, Kroll is the preeminent investigative uh, firm in the world. And uh, she has conducted, and I, I know that because she has uh, done that work with us, conducted numerous uh, reputational investigations um, on every continent 
and uh, with a great deal of success. So thanks to everybody for being here. And with that, John, it's all yours. Nope, I think it's mine. Oh, it's yours. I'm sorry, Stacey. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to pop up, um, not because I have a preference. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to kick us off this afternoon with a vignette uh, that I think will drive home why Aiken Gump is sponsoring today's event and why this topic is personal to us. So, oh, and there's a photo of our speakers. On September 11th, the United States was subjected to the most destructive terrorist attack in history. Most people grieved, some people resolved to fight, and yet others decided that the atrocity would present an opportunity. One such person is John Charles Brassard. <coughs> he is French, and while the rescue workers were truly digging through the rubble in the World Trade Center, Brassard typed up a report that he called the economic environment of Osama bin Laden. The report accused numerous prominent people and organizations of being the funding of Osama bin Laden and for Al-Qaeda. And Broussard had a friend in the French National Assembly. Within a month of the terrorist attack, <coughs> Broussard got his report slipped into the National Assembly's legislative record in Paris. Now, Broussard's report started to sound official a French parliamentary <coughs> report. He started getting attention, but he needed to do something big to really score. So he went where you go when you want to score big, New York City. In 2002, Broussard put his 34-page paper, which he had now entitled Terrorism Financing, Roots and Trends of Saudi Terrorism, he put that into an envelope and mailed it to the United Nations Security Council in New York City. Just to make it official, on the cover, he typed that his report had now been prepared for the President of the United Nations Security Council. Things started to move. By December 24th, that same year, Christmas Eve, the Los Angeles Times reported that Broussard's paper had been written at the request of the current president of the Security Council. Before long, Broussard had media reporting that uh, he was asked to study the issue of the terrorist financing by the UN Security Council. The Australian national television was calling Broussard the French intelligence expert who had briefed the United Nations Security Council on Al-Qaeda. And by the time Broussard's tale reached the Grey Lady, the New York Times, his paper was a well-respected report on the subject for the United Nations Security Council. Finally, in March of 2004, almost two years after Broussard typed up his paper and tried to attract attention as a terrorism expert, the United Nations Security Council finally blew the whistle. The president of the Security Council at the time, a Colombian uh, diplomat named Alfonso Valdiviso, issued a public statement that Broussard's story about being commissioned by the United Nations was made up and simply false. But by then, Broussard had gotten himself hired as the chief terrorism expert by a law firm, a US law firm, that had filed a massive lawsuit uh, against numerous Middle Eastern families and individuals who claimed they had been involved in the September 11 terrorist attacks. <coughs> the complete denial by the UN Security Council did not stop the story from continuing to grow. Pr Broussard published his own story in book form, complete with complicating looking charts that were alleged to show Al Qaeda's financing network. Then, the very wealthy people who Broussard claimed were financing bin Laden started to hear about his writing, which he had managed again to morph from a unsourced report to one that was commissioned by the UN Security Council, and they were not amused. One of those was an Aiken Gump client. 
So we did an investigation and invited Broussard to meet us in London, where we served him with a complaint filed in the High Court of Justice. The case didn't actually last long. Broussard had no facts, evidence, or much of anything else to back up his story. He publicly acknowledged that he made it all up, apologized to our client in open court, and promised not to tell any nasty stories. So I'm sure you're saying she was going to tell us why it was personal to Ake and Gum. Um, so remember Broussard's paper, as, as you will, that he turned into a book. Well, if you go to the back of Broussard's book and you look at that chart I had up before and you look closely, there in the corner, the Al-Qaeda financing network among all the killers, terrorists, and money launderers, that's right. According to Broussard, our law firm, Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, was part of the Al-Qaeda financing network. So the phenomenon of fake news is not new. This is nearly 15 years old, or actually more. Um, it's a tool in the hands of those seeking to influence currently democratic elections or otherwise promote a political agenda. Those seeking to damage a business competitor or, as we've just seen in the case of this UN, fake UN Security Council report, um, seeking to be something that they are not at the expense of others. Since that episode took place, we've had the explosion of social media uh, where much of the world is now obtaining its primary news and information. So as we saw in Broussard's episode, the law actually does provide some avenues for those harmed by fake news. Uh, to protect and recover their reputation uh, on the public record. Uh, but, and I'm sure many of you are deeply aware of this in the room, um, as the great American writer uh, and journalist, Mark Twain, said uh, more than 150 years ago, uh, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. So with that, I'm going to now actually turn it back to John, who's going to uh, kick off today's discussion. And I'm not going to leave it. Oh, and just a little prompt for Mark there. There's him as the cleaner. I will. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Stacy. That was uh, that was great. A uh, really great introduction to uh, the topics uh, we're looking at here. And um, since um, we saw a mention of, among other places, the New York Times, and that. Uh, Vignette. Um, I thought I would uh, start with uh, with Matt and ask, um, not specific to that, but just in general, um, in a situation where um, you have, uh, you know, something that's purporting to be uh, a primary source, which is you know what we uh, try to uh, focus on in, in uh, reporting out um, investigations and news. Um, how do you go about um, making sure that uh, it's something that you feel you can trust? And, and, uh, and then further to that, what do you do when you find that um, somebody's trying to uh, pull the wool over? Uh, I mean, what do you do, right? Um, how, I mean, how do you do it? It was sort of like, you know, how do you make an omelet? Right? Yeah. I, mean, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, the difference between... Uh, you know, I mean, the, the verification is a, the difference between journalism and just some random ass tweet, right? Mm -hmm. um, verification is the secret sauce. And uh, um, so, yeah, we get, we get people telling us stuff constantly all day long. I mean, you as well. All day long you hear things. Um, and your job would be a lot easier if that was enough. <laughs> uh, but... Um, <clears throat> you know, 90% of the time is you spend is verifying stuff you've heard. And mm -hmm. so you know, my, my general rule of thumb is somebody's telling me this for a reason, right? And, and it's not, I don't need it to be like, you know, I am a free speech absolutist and I want, I think the New York Times is the best and I think Mattapuzo is great and I just want to give you all that. I mean, that's fine. I haven't run it across anybody who's, <laughs> that's their motive. But everybody's got a motive for talking to a journalist. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, if you come with a financial motive or a, 
you know, revenge motive or a political motive. It doesn't, it doesn't mean I think less of the information you have, but I kind of just want to know that because I, it just makes me understand kind of what the angle is and where you're probably not telling me, you know, it's, I used to work for uh, an editor named Jim Drinkard who said uh, Drinkard's first rule, rule of journalism is that think of the absolute clearest easiest lead you could put on this story and you're not going to be able to do that because it's always way more complicated <laughs> and that's kind of it right mm -hmm. is uh you always just have to talk to more people and find more documents and verify verify more stuff mm -hmm. okay so um uh, taking it from the side of um uh, advising businesses and clients um uh zoe if if um if you have a uh a situation where a uh, company say is um, uh, accused of uh, some kind of wrongdoing in um, a um, you know what purports to be a you know a research report uh, that's uh, you know deeply investigated uh, by um, you know a uh, an entity that says that they are experts in the field um, uh, and um, I guess one thing to to look at. Uh, Say you know something gets out and it's actually having an effect, uh, say in the stock market, <coughs> something like that. So, so what what would be your approach um, to uh, both verifying you know that the information is what it purports to be, the people purveying it are who they say they are, and then contending with the uh, you know whatever damage the information is doing. Um. <coughs> Okay, that's a, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd start broad and then we yeah. can... Uh... Um, I think there's, there's, two si there's two answers to that question, depending on whether you're the, um, the, the corporate that's being targeted mm -hmm. um, or whether you're the investor in... Or an investor, for example, mm -hmm. in a company that's being targeted mm -hmm. or... Um, or, for example, you, you might be a regulator that's looking at reports of a company bribing overseas. Mm -hmm. um, if we take, you're the CEO of the corporate that's being targeted. Yeah, um, biggest, biggest trend, I would say, for mm. us over the last three years, and I don't think MIFID 2 is a big coincidence in relation to this, mm. um, is companies that are the victims, coming, coming to us that are the <coughs> victims of these spurious research notes that we've all seen and heard about there's there's plenty of press surrounding them nowadays um i think um that's arisen a lot from the, the deregulation of um uh, re, you know proper proper analyst research and mm -hmm. that could be the subject of a whole different panel session um what what we tend to advise is two things the first question that the client always comes to us and asks is um tell me who's written this goddamn no i want to go after them <laughs> um and it's much the same if if we are dealing with a whistleblower investigation it's the mm -hmm. first question that anyone wants the answer to mm -hmm. and we always advise them it's probably the worst thing you can focus on in the first instance mm -hmm. um, what you as the corporate need to be armed with is to be absolutely sure that what you're what you're being accused of um, isn't isn't true right. um, so the first step we undertake is um, a sort of an internal investigation effectively into what's being alleged mm -hmm. uh, to gather the facts to equip the management team the c-suite with um, a full paper um, that I mm -hmm. either you know, that equips them with how to deal with the issue that's being alleged, either from a regulatory perspective, depending on what being, they're being accused of, mm -hmm. from a PR perspective <coughs> or similar. Um, secondary to that might be looking into, OK, who's making the allegations, <coughs> who's written the research piece mm -hmm. and, um, and what's motivating them. Um, a recent case we did uh, last year, um, we undertook exactly that exercise. And what was interesting is we dug into... Um, the people behind this short selling ring mm. um, effectively <clears throat> um, was using a lot of detailed external investigations. So um, social media posts, tweets, trying to hone into who the individuals were, mm -hmm. um, a lot of dark web analysis to try and understand what was being chatted about within the dark web and similar. Mm. Uh, we were able to um, unusually successfully because it's hard to find out who's behind these yeah. identify who the individuals were um, and then ultimately um, figure out who 
uh, was financing them because usually the folk writing the piece are not the folk that are financing them. Um, obviously, most of our work will feed into legal action to, to go against disclosure, whether it's against Gmail or whether it's against Twitter or mm -hmm. etc. to find out who's ultimately behind the tweets. Um, that's, that's if it's the corporate that's being targeted. Yeah. Um, if you're an external... Um, if you're the victim, you know, if you're an investor and you're, you're reading one of these pieces, it's tough. It all depends how high profile. But if you're external, obviously you haven't got the benefit of going to the internal information and assessing what's what's there for you. And that's really, as Matt and will more than understand, trying to tri triangulate what's being alleged. So not taking at face value one one report in one um, publication. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually where we would go to the source information to try and um, understand a bit more <coughs> granularly who's saying what about right. um, and get a bit more close to the detail. Yeah, sounds good. And um, <coughs> uh, as far as, um, uh, you know, there's uh, been a lot of, um, you know, leaking of uh, documents, leaking of, uh, you know, sort of um, internal uh, government um, documents, classified documents, uh, that, um, you know, poses particular uh, challenges. I know, um, uh, Mark, that uh, you guys have, um, you have some uh, thoughts on, um, you know, looking, you know, how do you determine the authenticity of, um, you know, something that, you know, purports to have come out of, say, a leaked government cable or something like that? Yeah, well, um, you know, Matt and Adam Goldman and, and people in the national security business are, are regular recipients um, of, of leaked. Not regular enough. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, that's, and that's actually a good thing, and, mm -hmm. and it's a good thing when whistleblowers come forward and expose uh, misconduct or corruption. Uh, but it but it is a crime mm -hmm. uh, if you if you have possession of classified information um, Many critics have said that the United States and I suspect other Western NATO countries over classify uh, a great deal of information that probably doesn't need to be uh, need to be protected um, What what has changed that is the the mass um, disclosure of, uh, of classified or secret information uh, the two most notable events were uh, Chelsea Manning to WikiLeaks with uh, Julian Assange recently back in the news and Edward Snowden, the uh, analyst in the United States uh, four years ago who also released a very large um, component of, uh, of classified information. That's different, and, and um, Matt may want to speak to this as well, that's different from a leaker who, who wants the, the public to know about specific acts of misconduct or conduct in, in government that, um, that ought to be exposed. Um, that's sort of a wholesale um, massive release of information. And the reason I talk about that is that between the time that massive information is released or, or you know, sent into some sort of public forum, uh, and the time it's incorporated into some actual journalism, it's subject to manipulation, and we, we've seen that happen. So, uh, you know, when, a, when an analyst um, from a government agency comes to a national security reporter and hands over a document, that journalist has a pretty good um, level of, of confidence that he's, he or she's receiving uh, actual classified information. When you have a wholesale release, it's subject to all kinds of manipulation, and there were particularly with the... Uh, some of the WikiLeaks releases, documents that purported to be classified, purported to be secret, uh, once they were in the hands of people who had a case to make, uh, were, were changed and altered such that, you know, what, what had been embassy cables were, were suddenly in doubt about whether the content was really complete. Um, and so that's another area where mischief can, can take place. But in, in the United States, um, to, if you have access to classified information and you knowingly hand it over for whatever reason, that's a crime. In fact, the Justice Department um, has a policy where they, they do not prosecute journalists and do not really investigate journalists except under very unusual circumstances um, for uh, the publication of classified information. On the other hand, if you are the government uh, employee who releases it, you are subject to prosecution. There have been a number of those cases um, recently. The, the risk is when there's the mass release that then goes, into, goes through many hands before it's in the hands of a journalist. So, mm -hmm. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? I guess I, I would just say that um, getting stuff when you when you know the source as a journalist, it, 
you can have confidence that that's you know, you've you've vetted that source, and he or she is is somebody as Mark said who's coming from an intelligence agency who you've worked with in the past, and they give you a document. You pretty, feel pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. Getting stuff in the mail or getting stuff over email is really really complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean the the most sort of famous case for us recently was uh, in twenty. Uh, 17, I think it was 2017 or 18, uh, Sue Craig, one of our investigative reporters in, um, uh, in New York, got, just went to her mailbox and had the tax returns for Donald Trump for one year, years and years ago, well, very old, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, spent forever trying to figure out, are those really his, I mean, this is paper, mm -hmm. you know, this is from like 1995, if I remember correctly. In 1998, how do you verify that that's real? Mm -hmm. And you spend a lot of time when you get stuff in over the transom figuring out, is this real? Um, you know, is this, am I being trolled here? Mm -hmm. Is somebody, you know, trying to embarrass me or embarrass the times? Um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing better from a critic standpoint is put out bad information on yourself and, and make it, you know, put out bad information, give it to a reporter, or that reporter runs with it, and then you say, see, that you, know, you can't trust that reporter. So that's what I'm constantly terrified about. Yeah, and so in a situation like that, and, and we've talked about, you know, determining the motives behind, you know, somebody giving you uh, or, you know, giving the, uh, the paper information, um, what uh, can you do to determine the motives in a case where you've just gotten a, a document, uh, you know, do you know, you know, uh, I, I mean, in Sue's case, did she even know who it yeah, was from? Yeah, she didn't or? know who it was from. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, prosecuting a document blind is hard. I mean, mm -hmm. I all want to hear how you all do this. Uh, <laughs> prosecuting a document blind is really hard. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the first things you do is, like, go and find another document just like it from that year mm -hmm. Uh and, you know, that filing type and see if it matches up. And I think ultimately what happened was there was a weird typesetting thing. I'm doing this from memory. There was a weird typesetting thing that gave everybody pause mm. because it was like there was an extra zero and it was off. It was offset. And so it made everybody like this doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. And they actually found like the 80 year old accountant like who had <laughs> filed it for them right. uh, in Florida somewhere. And they flew down and took it to him and said, did you file this? And he's like, yeah, I think I did file that. That looks right. And he said, well, what about this zero? Because it's like offset. And he's like, I definitely filed this because <laughs> my computer program back then didn't allow for that many zeros. So I had to go in like manually with a typewriter or something and like put in the extra zero. He's like, that definitely is true. So, wow. um, you know, that again, that's the difference between just like some random ass tweet and, uh, you know, in journalism. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, um, and you know. So one one issue um, with uh, you know false uh, false stories, false accusations, fake news, if you will, um, in the U.S. in particular, it can be um, you know sort of uh, difficult to um, uh, to uh, get relief if uh, a client of yours is, has uh, faced um, you know a uh, an accusation that's uh, that's false. Um, you know, given the uh, the nature of the, uh, the libel and uh, defamation laws there, um, Stacy, uh, is there anything you can tell the folks about? Uh, you know, sort of wh what avenues of legal relief there are in a case like that for uh, you know if, uh, if a client is uh, is facing uh, that kind of uh, uh, negative uh, and false information. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, so actually, if, if in fact the allegation is false, and it is demonstrably false, mm -hmm. um, and you've done your investigative work uh, instead of acting, as, as Zoe, Zoe said, don't just jump in and, and, and make allegations, but rather investigate and you can conclusively prove that it's false, actually the, the U.S. law is, is a pretty good weapon. Mm. Um, However, what, what I think many people don't like and what is a distinction from fake news is opinions that you don't like. Mm. Uh, because somebody's opinion that is different than yours that may convey or feel as though it is conveying 
false news about you is simply an opinion and really is not prosecutable or enforceable, mm -hmm. forcible or subject to being uh, removed as a lawsuit. So that is really, I think, uh, when we're talking about fake news, the biggest issue would be going out and, and being able to conclusively establish mm -hmm. that it is false. Mm -hmm. Um, I, we will also, and, and Mark can jump in here as well, I mean, <clears throat> litigation is not necessarily the best, best option, but if you know it is an option that it sort of opens up a, a whole host of ways in which to get um, the speaker, if you can identify them, to, to withdraw um, the false statement. And mm -hmm. that's certainly um, much referring back to the Mark Twain comment, uh, the quicker you can get the false statement off the street, mm -hmm. uh, the better it is, particularly if you are the corporate entity that is uh, trying to protect its reputation. So. Uh. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that I mean, real journalists, and I'm, I'm not talking about somebody who's living in his mother's basement in Amsterdam, <laughs> you know, smoking dope until 10 at night and then deciding to tweet, is a real journalist. Uh, but real journalists all want to get it right. And almost always when, when we have a, a situation where uh, there's a story that has some false facts, the, the journalist and her editors will want to get it right. And, and um, you don't need to go the litigation route. You don't even need to talk about that because if you have superior facts or better documented facts, uh, that'll resolve it very quickly. The value of, of being able to seek relief in a court on the rare occasions when you have to um, is that, that that's a forum that allows you to ferret out the people in the, the deep undergrowth of social media. Um, you know, we've heard much discussion in the last few months, even the last few weeks, of how social media may have influenced the last U.S. presidential election. Um, those are sources that have required uh, really all the um, resources of the federal government and intelligence community to ferret out in, in Russia. But on a, in a business context, that happens all the time. And your, your ability to use the court system in the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, other, you know, jurisdictions that will provide you with the tools of discovery is very powerful. And, and it's, it's effective because you so rarely have to actually use it in order to, uh, you know, to, to, to get to where you need to get to. Mm -hmm. now, now, picking up on that uh, point about uh, social media, you know, um, one uh, challenge I'm sure in this area is, um, oh, thank you. Uh, one, one challenge in this area is, um, you know, of course, the, uh, the ability of, um, uh, you know, information to you know, sort of go viral before anybody's had an opportunity to, uh, you know, necessarily verify it or, or uh, you know, sort of uh, pin down, um, uh, you know, the, the real truth of it. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Zoe, if, um, if you... Uh, have a, a client with a situation like that, um, uh, what kind of recourse uh, do you feel like there is or, you know, what's your approach when there's something that's, you know, out on social media, it's very hard to, you know, sort of uh, stuff back into a bottle mm -hmm. um, all the avenues that it's gotten out into. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you, how do you approach that? Well, that's, that's often where panic sets in <laughs> and <laughs> all the board preparation goes out of the window. Yeah. Um, I think, um, th not, I'm not doing a promotion here, breaking gum, <laughs> but, but that is where we would, we would work alongside law firms. So mm -hmm. that's where very much, um, what we, a lot of what we do is the forensic analysis nowadays of social media. Um, the, there's there's a hell of a lot of, of um, information that you could obtain legally and publicly because so many people um, don't realise how much is public from their use of social media. So, for example, um, we we had one situation where there was allegations, um, quite defamatory allegations being made about the CEO um, of a corporate having an affair with um, an employee and sort of... Um, fairly low end allegations but public publicity wise it was it was um, uncomfortable to mm. say the least mm -hmm. um, uh, by geotagging a lot of the Twitter posts um, and and people cleverer than I am within our organization um, we were able to sort of pinpoint where a lot of these tweets were coming from <laughs> uh, and it was in 
in the office block of the corporate we were investigating. Um, uh, so at which point then that directed us then to more computer forensics internally within uh, the corporate IT environment mm -hmm. that we were then able to pin down um, to an employee eventually and mm -hmm. pinpoint what was happening there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that one of, we've all seen a lot of PR disasters of late um, where um, uh, particularly in regard to s cyber breaches um, and I think that's the area where this is probably um, really relevant nowadays because um, there's a lot of panic um, that happens when there's sort of a blackmail attempt effectively um, mm -hmm. on the board to say we're going to release this data uh, and there's numerous examples and, and quite often this is where what's the saying when you see you swimming naked when the tide goes out? I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lack of preparation for sort of cyber issues comes to the fore. Um, because quite often um, we've seen corporates that um, information's being leaked and uh, gradually over days um, by the cyber blackmailers and they don't actually know if it's theirs, if it's their customer data, if it's their client data, etc. because their systems are so disorganized and everyone is just in a panic scramble racing around. They realize their systems aren't integrated, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So I think there's there's quite a lot of preparation that can be done and we see nowadays corporates doing a hell of a lot, hell of, a lot of sort of crisis PR preparation, so there is some loose plan in place mm -hmm. um, as to what to do in these sorts of emergency situations because mm -hmm. the biggest problem, and again it often happens with cyber breaches, is there's a PR piece put out straight away saying this this hasn't happened and then when you have to retract it a week later when you realise it has, it's horrifically embarrassing. Yeah. So. Um, there's no, there's not one answer to the question, no, but course, um, yeah. it's the planning up front and in advance. Get it? It's the same answer as Stacey was just saying before. It's, it's always unfortunately there has to be some time given to gather the facts internally. Mm -hmm. How quickly and efficiently you can do that depends on how much organisation uh, you've done in yeah, advance course, to yeah. sort of uh, anticipate these sorts of situations mm -hmm. happening. And I would just jump in, um, if you manage to, if we, if we are successful in helping our clients take a moment, take a breath, and investigate, mm -hmm. particularly with the random tweet that you get from time to time, um, it doesn't repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And then you've actually convinced the client and you can work with the client to say, we're ready. Mm -hmm. We've now investigated if it shows back up, we're ready, but it hasn't shown up in one week or two weeks or how long we've taken. And in fact, by having a little patience, you've avoided creating a much bigger story mm -hmm. out of the false story in the first instance. And yeah. so there is a sort of a dual benefit if you if you work it the right way. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, creating a bigger story uh, out of uh, out of the information. You know, I guess uh, they call it the uh, Streisand effect uh, from, uh, there was a, a Forgetting, do you remember yeah. what the story was? <laughs> that, that oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Barbara Streisand, the famous actress, uh, didn't want her home to be uh, featured on uh, online mapping and uh, like Google Maps and whatnot and, uh, and fought to try to do that, which, of course, the Internet <laughs> fought back. And so, you know, it was ultimately, you know, blurred out her, her mansion by the sea. Right, which only then encouraged everybody who could to go and take pictures of her house and put them right. on the internet, right? right. So the Streisand effect is like the effort to try to stop something from being public yeah. that would only maybe be seen by five people right. will only get you seen by 30 million people. Yeah, right. yeah I think it, it occurred again with uh, uh, Representative Devin Nunez yes. in, um, yeah. in California <laughs> where he uh, was upset about... Uh, some uh, yes, <laughs> he was upset about some Twitter accounts, including one called Devin Nunez's Cow, which had a few hundred followers when he started getting upset about it. And yes. as soon as he publicized his anger at all of these, he you know they uh, had tens of thousands of followers. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's something to uh, watch out for. Um, well, I'm uh, I'd love to uh, open it up to um, any uh, sorry, <laughs> love to open it up to any uh, questions uh, if anyone. Uh, has any, um, sir? Uh. Uh, yeah, quick point was, I mean, he, uh, he brought lawsuits about those oh, uh, yes, exactly, cases, yeah. which uh, is, uh, um, question, I mean, to what extent have we, as journalists, brought this upon ourselves? Mm. Um, I remember sitting in the Reuters office 
eight years ago and having some manager, used to be a journalist, uh, was now a global coordinator or whatever they wanted to, to whatever title they wanted to give uh, in this particular case, telling us we've got to give clients what they want. So, excuse me, I don't have clients. <laughs> people I write for, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't consider them clients. If it's a story, it's a story. Uh, but the pressure was uh, from all sides. I mean, uh, you've got businesses that publish information that don't make a lot of money, mm -hmm. frankly, and businesses that are attached to them that sell information, sell information citizen, systems, etc., that do make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, over the years, I've seen hundreds of journalists leave journalism because it's paying less and less, of course, and going to PR. Mm -hmm. Now, when you've got 500 PR people in one bank fighting against one story, calling mm -hmm. your editor, calling your editor's boss, calling mm -hmm. your boss's boss, calling the CEO, <coughs> and trying to prevent stories, if you're going to cave in to that sort of pressure, even when you've got all the details to publish, mm -hmm. you're going to cave in because somebody's threatened you with a lawsuit, then you're in trouble uh, because you give free run to, uh, to uh, fake news. Mm -hmm. Somebody sees a gap and says, well, why didn't they publish that? Mm -hmm. We knew about that earlier. How comes? Um, talking about uh, information coming in anonymously. I mean, this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, we have a different, uh, as online journalists, we have a different um, type of pressure somebody who's sending you anonymous stuff wants a story out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't do it, then usually they'll get back to you and you'll find out who it is mm. um, because there is certainly a vested interest there uh, of one way or another. Uh, um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm worried <laughs> about is yeah. to what extent have we brought this on ourselves by undervaluing news, by <coughs> deciding that news needs to be... Um, uh, subordinate to other business interests of the, I'm told you will know yourself, Matt, uh, on the advertising front, on the access journalism front, which you mm, are probably well aware of as well, um, that, you know, go out and get stories, but if I'm only talking to bank CEOs, I'm not really getting a whole story, am I? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that, that we, some of what you said, I guess we brought on ourselves. Uh, but I mean, look, the consolidation in the industry and the sort of the death of local news and the, you know, the the uh, disruption of the advertiser model, like we didn't, we didn't bring that on ourselves. <laughs> I mean, um, but I, I do think that, uh, I do think that one thing that the public and journalists are going to have to figure out is... Um, you know, how to calibrate the trust equation, which is a huge thing right now, right? We've, there's, uh, if anybody can publish, right? If, if any, and I think that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. If anybody can publish and the barrier to entry into the news space or the opinion space is eliminated, then what makes me different is no longer my medium. It is no longer, you know, the fact that I can publish on the internet or that I can print the newspaper. <laughs> It is something else, right? And so I think we're now in a end, and what is further complicating that is I'm publishing on the same medium as people who just make shit up, mm -hmm. and it is distributed by the same social platforms. Right. It's very and, hard to and make so, a distinction. And so, you know, you can... You can uh, you know, all of that stuff on this PowerPoint seems like quaint. Like, I, well, he mailed it. Like, he took the time to mail the letter to the United Nations. You don't even do that now. Just slap the words United Nations on it. Get a seal off of Google Images and say it is a United Nations report. Put it on Twitter and it'll be viral by the end of the day. Yeah. So I feel like we need to rebalance. We need to figure out the trust equation. Uh, I think brands like the New York Times, Bloomberg, the Washington Post... Reuters, I think they're going to be fine. I worry about, I worry about local news. I worry about the access of people, uh, access to people, uh, 
by people to information mm -hmm. about their schools and their local legislatures and their you know their town board of selectmen. That's where I that's where I really feel the problem is 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 heading. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sir. Yes, I fear that you all are too smart professionals and hover much too high above my head for lousy journalists like me. So I will tell you what fake news look like from the point of view of a lousy Geneva-based <laughs> journalist strolling between Club de la Presse and Place des Nations. So the other day, I was down the street at Place des Nations. And there was a car, a government car, it was the city or the county, can't remember. 100% electric, 0% CO2. Of course, this is fake news because there is no way to prove that the electricity has been produced by hydro or nuclear power. Okay, supported by the city. Just across the street, there is a rock. It's a newly inaugurated um, a memory uh, monument to the Rwanda genocide. Mm. Over one million dead. I know that people who do, who indulge into macabre arithmetic are not popular in our profession, but still, today I went to check from the best sources half a million. Mm. Also probably supported by the city and the county and the mission, etc. Third case. Um, I was attending a press conference with WHO the other day. And in the discussion, I asked a question because I heard that serious first class medical research is no longer what it used to be. And then I learned from the WHO officials that even the New England Journal of Medicine, the Bible, which, what for 72 years I had believed be the Bible of medical research, is total bullshit and I should not re, uh, believe a lie. Fourth example, Reporters Sans Frontières. Oh, Reporters Sans Frontières, the conscience, the warden of the conscience, the guardian of the conscience of the profession. They sent recently for their last campaign the picture of three journalists. Mm. Without us, these journalists could never have performed a magnificent investigation. Among the three was Marie-Monique Robin. She may be the best investigative journalist ever, but my friends, investigative journalists, think very ill of her, and she was once proven to have made a documentary which was fake news, but she was already famous at that time and supported by the activists, uh, civil society activists, so it was played down. Then I asked Christophe Deloire, the boss of Reporters Sans Frontières, are you sure that Ma uh, Marie-Monique Robin is, uh, deserves to be the icon you claim, I don't know, I have no idea. I mean, how irresponsible it is from, yeah. the, from Reporters Sans Frontières to campaign under the name of, of these people and then when asked an embarrassing question, we don't know. It's not, I could go on, I go, to, <laughs> I, I go every day to Palais des Nations, I came mm -hmm. to the conclusion mm -hmm. that this, uh, NGOs are the main source of fake news. Okay. So the problem, the problem, well, sorry, <laughs> it's maybe not a true question, it's a commentary. <laughs> the, okay. the, pro the problem the is yeah. that these, these kind of fake news yeah. are much more dangerous than the obvious ones. Yeah. You know, there was at the time of the uh, controversy about negationism of the gas chamber. Mm. A, a French historian was being asked, would you go and discuss with these people? And he said, would you discuss with someone who said the moon is a piece of cheese? It is not dangerous right. to say that the moon is a piece of cheese. But to instill among intellectuals, mm. all these fake news as a great truth, and it plays, you know, the one about CO2 plays a crucial role in all the debates for years now. Yeah. This is, this is, and my conclusion mm -hmm. is that the only piece of true news I ever read in my life is that today there will be a panel of distinguished experts <laughs> and the discussion will be lively. I have never read anything in the past few years coming from intellectual progressive people and especially experts on fake news, which I do not consider absolute brainwashing. Well, thanks. Uh, um, well, that, that brings me to a question, actually. Um, 
Uh, you, you mentioned NGOs and, and other, you know, sort of institutional um, actors, um, you know, uh, governments even, uh, that can have their own agendas, that can be, you know, acting in support of um, industries that they have and, uh, you know, and um, acting against the interests of um, industries in other countries or, you know, companies in other countries. Um, for you know anyone who wants to take it, uh, you know how do you sort of deal with um, you know things that do verifiably come out of a, a government or or a, a a known organization that nevertheless are you know pushing an agenda, possibly using you know information that's that's not uh, that's not accurate. Well, it's it's not uncommon, uh, and it it's directed in in. Uh, oh. It's directed in, in many directions. I mean, it, it's, you know, certainly in industries that are, uh, you know, that are subsidized or that are state-owned, um, it's not at all uncommon. And uh, certainly in the political realm, it's, 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 a, regular, um, it's a regular feature of life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your legal options are limited. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are avenues through which uh, you can expose um, if you can find a, a place where you, the courts will give you jurisdiction and you can gain access to, uh, to the discovery process where you can expose that. Um, but, you know, the real, I think the real threat would be in the, in the political arena where, um, you know, governments are, are willing to, uh, and, and all governments are in that business to some extent, mm -hmm. but when they focus that effort on, um, uh, on promoting a particular industry, a particular, I mean, you know, currently the U.S. aircraft manufacturer Boeing is under pressure. There are other state-owned uh, aircraft manufacturers that are probably very interested in, in that story getting a lot of traction. Um, and uh, and I, I, th I think you have to rely on, to, 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 to a large degree, um, professional journalism, the highest echelons of journalism, to, to ferret out the truth. And that's mm -hmm. a tough job. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I would just add to that. Um, being here in, in Europe now, uh, after having been in Washington for many years, I mean, the, the whole Huawei thing is fascinating, right? I mean, if there was a, if there was a, a private security company or an analytical group or an NGO that said uh, there are security vulnerabilities in Huawei, but we, are, we can't tell you what they are, we're not going to tell you what they are, but you shouldn't use Huawei, I think we would look a little skeptically at that. Uh, and I think, you know, as somebody who's covered security agencies for a long time, I mean, I think they're they're being honest with us that they believe that these that they have evidence that there are security problems. Uh, but being in Europe, what's so interesting is you hear from people in other governments, people who work hand in hand with U.S. intelligence agencies, and they're like. Yeah, but is this just like protectionists? You know, you're just putting out the intelligence agencies to beat back the Huawei stuff to, you know, so they at and And it's so interesting because it's just a totally different way to think about, you know, government intelligence. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, um, one, uh, one newspaper's gold standard is another, one country's gold standard is another country's sort of, you know, view skeptically. Mm -hmm. I think Matt raises an important point here. We we all sort of rail against fake news and are getting very frustrated about it recently. In a number of countries, particularly Eastern Europe, this has been an issue for decades and decades. Um, and it's becoming, um, you know, and, and I think that's where the standard of journalism that Matt and his peers are involved in is, is so important. Um, and we see the backlash of that a lot lately in what the banks are calling de-risking, mm. um, but in whole swathes of um, high, usually high net worth customers from the Middle East, Eastern Europe, elsewhere, um, uh, being de-risked. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, a number of them have very complex backgrounds and, and are far from white. Um, but are very good and interesting clients of financial institutions. Um, but the problem we see is the funding and the budget to do KYC tends to rest with a very junior individual on Google looking at a little bit of LexisNexis, mm -hmm. um, writing up a report that when you read it looks horrific. Yeah. Um, and there's no way in a million years anyone's got the appetite to touch them. Um, <laughs> 
and 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 that's that's something that's been going on for a long time but you know of i would say in the last three to five years uh, perhaps longer is becoming even more of an issue in that there's i don't know if it's generational but there's a lack of appetite to um contextualize um and understand culturally where a number of these articles are coming from mm-hmm. um and i always uh, um recall um one client and this was a number of years ago now because the budgets aren't there to do the same who said that they'd retained crawl and another firm and I'm, I'm not doing a sales pitch to um look at um, a russian individual um and and both came back pretty similar but one uh, and both said that the client um the subject had been charged with uh, tax offenses um but only one, which was ours, gave context around the time and the fact that this was fairly typical around, uh, you know, lo- in in the jurisdiction at the time. There's mm-hmm. a method to use against, so it wasn't something that should be viewed as a major um, issue. Um, what we see, and we've worked a number of cases um, together, are um, cl- um, clients of ours that have the funds to deal with their reputational issues putting together in huge investment um, because they want to attract financing from the West and they want to go to the capital markets in the West in in basically doing a KYC on steroids on themselves. Mm. Um, and these are almost huge, huge autobiographies, warts and all, and some of them are quite difficult reading. Um, but those are the clients that have the will to open up and have someone else look all over them and and forensically go through how they've built their wealth um um and it's it's an uncomfortable experience for high net worths that are used to being very closed mm. um and then taking those autobiographies proactively to the financial institutions that they want to deal with um and that's the only way that they're finding they can get proper banking relationships of the size that they need but that but I do think it's something and I'm going a bit off piste here, but generationally we have to um, educate the new sort of bright young things coming through that just because it's on Google, it's not true. The number of times I have to say Wikipedia is not, and it's, you know, that's <laughs> fake news. Source, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, and they're amazed when they actually realise. Um, but the number of times I see Wikipedia being... Uh, footnoted in in reports of fact i'm just like yeah. what um you know that that i'm sure back in your training days you'd have been fired for <laughs> um so yeah that's just yeah. my comment no oh, great um well if, if anyone has a a brief uh question uh at all uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any place in this world for a third party somehow international organization to validate either news organizations, news facts, mm. or is or has trust eroded in those kind of things to such a degree that it's not possible both from a legal and a journalist perspective. I I don't want there to be <laughs> any institution going out giving check marks for like, you know, you're real, you're fake. I just think that, you know, uh the ramifications for that uh, to go off the rails seem seem the the risk seems awfully high, and and the people who aren't going to believe it aren't going to believe it anyways. So it's it's, it's I see a, like only a, downside, a risk, no upside. If I if I may, oh, one I, second. I I, I, th- I think you're starting to see the beginning of that, not in the sense of a regulatory agency, but self regulation by the social media companies, mm. uh, Facebook and Twitter in particular. In the United States, uh, there has been a rash of um, very extreme fake news. I mean, fake news that has prompted violence. And for the first time, you're seeing the, the, the electronic bulletin boards, because that's how the law treats them. They're not responsible for what's, what's being posted in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, some of them actually looking at the content and saying some of this is just so far outside the white lines that we're just not going to participate in it. Mm-hmm. Whether that's the, you know, the beginning of a hill or a bump in the road, I don't, I don't know, but, but, but you're, you're, you're starting to see a, a heightened level of responsibility in the social media world. Come, yep. come last one, just, just um, in regards to law firms and their commitment to uh, 
to real news. Um, I was thinking, you know, I mean, I've been contacted by all swings and part of rock and God knows what they shows and God knows who else over the years. And it's always been rather confrontational, to be perfectly honest, because I'm dealing with something that I consider to be uh, an aspect of news that the public has a right to know. You may have a client who doesn't want that news to be public. Uh, a few years ago, I was working on a story, and a lawyer for a, a bank in Bahrain contacted me and said, Mo, got that story because they were going through an acquisition of a football team at the time. And I said, they've got no money. <coughs> Their balance sheet was fake. Um, it's uh, <coughs> over, basically, they've inflated their assets by 200 million. They had no liquidity, and they could demonstrate it from their own details, mm -hmm. from their own uh, uh, profit and loss, their balance sheet, etc. Um, and it only took an afternoon with an editor to actually go through this because editors, unfortunately, are not financially literate. <laughs> um, Guilty. Now, <laughs> the problem was that once they had got in touch with the editor and the boss and the boss of the boss and the boss of the boss of the boss, I was held up for three weeks. In the meantime, this deal went through. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, I think we failed in our duty to publish something that was pertinent at the time. When we published, the deal had already gone through. All I was saying was, you've got no money, man, and that. <laughs> but um, this, unfortunately, has been prevented by uh, a legal threat. Yeah, so sometimes the, really the, process, uh, the process achieves its own end. Okay. Uh, in the end, it's the result, it's a number of investors are defrauded. A football team, which was my football team in the UK, <laughs> ends up with no money for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bank and somebody else make out like bandits because they, uh, uh, they can actually suffer money from the football team and become bankrupts in various bits and pieces at the same time. For, for what? Now, this was um, a result of a legal threat. My question again to what extent are law firms committed to uh, actual news uh, coming out unimpeded, or mm. does it just depend on the crime? I mean, I would, I'll, I'll just from a journalism standpoint, and I'll let Mark and those guys answer from a legal standpoint. I just, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to move on a timeline uh, when you're getting the sort of legal pressure. Uh, but I also think it's good. I think it, when, it's not, when it's not me in the moment and my story, like I think intellectually I can say I think it's good to get that pushback um, uh, and good to get kind of put through the ringer, uh, better to be put through your paces on the front end than have to deal with it on the back end. But yeah, look, uh, when when whether it's a lawyer or a PR agency, when they're just running out the clock, I think then it's, from a reporter's standpoint, it's just time to have a frank conversation with your editor with like, look, this is, they're just trying to run out the clock. And sometimes you can get it done on the timeline you want, and sometimes you can't. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't expect a lawyer in that situation to be on my side. Like, they're <laughs> calling to get me to, right? I don't blame the lawyer. They, they, have, they have their client. Mm -hmm. And on well, the legal I, side. Yeah. I mean, I think it also depends on for what purpose that lawyer is calling and what that lawyer is saying, right? I, I mean, Right. I mean, and, and I think um, very different from a lawyer calling and saying, hey, that is a false story. Um, you better be careful or we will sue. That's a very different thing than, hey, it's not a good time now. And there's sort of a business push to, to, get, it, to get it pushed back. And I also think much in the way that there are various and sundry different levels of journalists. You know, I'm sitting with two of the finest journalists. And I think there's many more out here. And then Mark referred to the the person who has access on the internet from Amsterdam. I mean, there are, just as there are that varied and sundry different journalists, there are that varied and sundry different lawyers. But you and saw so, it with Theranos. I mean, Theranos yeah. is, a, is a great example, right? I mean, where, you know, Boy Schiller killed, killed mm -hmm. stories or, or walked back stories or pushed back stories again and again and again and again and again. Uh, and, you know, turned and, and, you know, Boys is on the, board of directors at the Ranos, right? I mean, so, uh, you know, I guess I, I would say, again, from a journalism standpoint, like, 
you know when the lawyers are coming in that they're not they're not coming to help. Yes. You know, um, from a journalism standpoint, they're you know, if you're writing about somebody and they're sending a lawyer to your office, they're not they're not coming with gifts. No offense, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I'll take uh, one there. Uh, yeah, you haven't discussed the uh, Trump-Russia uh, involvement, and you think that that was also just a, uh, an issue that the media ran with it, and they still cannot get over on it. Hmm. What, what can't we get over? Well, that uh, there's no, uh, it wasn't uh, any crime that was Apart from going on. No, but I think, I think, look, I think, the difference between a journalist and a prosecutor is that we're not, we're not trying to put anybody in jail, right? I think if there is and there was a sophisticated uh, intelligence agency-led foreign, foreign, foreign intelligence operation aimed at manipulating the 2016 presidential election and one campaign benefited and one campaign had repeated contacts with intelligence and related officials and uh, and they were having secret meetings and they were repeatedly lying about it if that isn't news like if that's I don't I'm not saying that's a crime but that's news right like that's news people should know so to the extent that uh, we'll say well it turned out there was no crime Okay, it turned out that there was a sophisticated investigation that had access to tools that we had no access to and came out and said, everything we wrote, yeah, that was all true. Um, and we take no position on whether or not a crime was committed because the President of the United States uh, can't be indicted. Mm -hmm. Again, I go with that was news. Yeah, and I guess I, I would just say, uh, I think in, in that instance, um, Part of the issue is is the conflation uh, that many people make between the news side of things and the opinion side of things, and of course they often appear, you know, again on the same social media, you know, different parts of the same newspapers, but people don't make the distinction. And so, while of the news stories, we're just carefully saying, here is what looks like this, this, and this, and these are these facts that we know, and they're being investigated. On the opinion side, there were people saying there are these facts that we know and President Trump should be thrown out of office, you know. And so when somebody reads a, you know, a columnist saying that, um, they say, well, the newspaper said Trump should be thrown out of office. So, that, so that's one of the challenges, I think, that, you know, that we have in, in journalism is, is maintaining that, uh, that uh, news versus opinion distinction. But, um, um, okay, well, if, if anyone has one, I think there's one more there. Just one more, if I may. Yeah. Uh, much of the discussion has been on the, on the impacts uh, of fake news commercially, reputationally, politically. I'd like to draw attention to an even more insidious impact of fake news, and that's on what we call vaccine hesitancy. Mm. Uh, we see increasingly in social media, uh, which, which started long before social media had been died down since the wake piece stuff. But again, on social media, we see increasing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well... Uh, in the case of vaccination, the problem is not so we're, much... We're, can, we're not going to debate vaccination. Yeah. We're, Sorry, it's like getting a little not, outside. We're not going to do that. The problem is not... We're not going to do it. The problem is not about the news. The problem is there is no more a knowledge authority to tell the truth. We're not going to do vaccination. <laughs> sorry, you are you are a censor. I am sorry. We don't have yes. the same well, the, sa the same uh, image of what our profession should be. I I think I made it very clear in my point the, before. Uh, yes, you can, and I I like to know why you staged this over, meeting tonight. This has not been explained. The audience is very un 
customary for here, so <laughs> maybe you can tell us a few words. Where am I today, this afternoon here? Well, uh, I'm sure I'm sure we can uh, discuss that over over cocktails momentarily. Uh, <laughs> missing the best part. <laughs> anyway, um, well, uh, I want to uh, thank everyone uh, for coming. I want to thank the uh, panel for their uh, excellent uh, participation. And, um, you know, as, as is often the case in uh, journalism and law, we can't please everyone, <laughs> but uh, um, hope that you will stay for, uh, for cocktails and conversation afterward. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you.